I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Welcome to this first online edition of our Books in Print Talks, an ongoing series hosted by the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Books in Print Talks are presented by UO faculty authors whose recently published books were supported by an Oregon Humanities Center Research Fellowship and or an Oregon Humanities Center subvention grant to help cover publication costs. Today's talk will be given by Erin Hanna, Assistant Professor of Cinema Studies. Her book, Only at Comic-Con, Hollywood, Fans, and the Limits of Exclusivity, published by Rutgers University Press in 2019, received an OHC publication subvention grant. Erin's research focuses on the relationship between media industries and audiences. She teaches courses on television, the film industry, fan culture, and gender, media, and diversity. Welcome, Erin. I'm looking forward to hearing about your book. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Okay, I'm just going to set up the screen share here. All right, well, so thank you so much for hosting this event. Thank you to Paul and the Oregon Humanities Center. Um, I'm really excited to talk about my book today. Uh, even though it only came out four months ago, this is 2020 is feeling like a, the longest year ever. So I feel <laughs> like I'm coming back to this project after an extremely long time. Um, so only at Comic-Con, Hollywood fans and the limits of exclusivity uh, looks basically at the history of the San Diego Comic-Con in order to better understand its place in contemporary popular culture. And in particular in the book, I'm interested in looking at this connection between the kind of exclusivity that's cultivated around the event and by the event and the proliferation of media industry promotion that is simultaneously happening at Comic-Con. So the big questions that my book asks are first, what made the San Diego Comic-Con a Hollywood destination? How does the industry's presence at Comic-Con kind of shape our ideas about what it means to be a fan? And then what can this single event tell us more broadly about the relationship um, between media industries and their fans, both in the past and in the present? And so obviously I can't answer all those questions today. So in the spirit of Comic-Con, I'm gonna give you an exclusive sneak peek at the book. And then also in the spirit of Comic-Con, hopefully try to leave you wanting more um, when it's all done. So to start off for folks that maybe aren't so familiar with uh, the San Diego Comic-Con, it's among the largest and longest running popular conventions in the world. Um, it was founded in 1970 by a small group of comic book fantasy and science fiction fans in the San Diego area. And the first Comic-Con was significantly smaller than what you see today. So it was held in the basement of San Diego's Grant Hotel, which is actually quite a quite a lovely hotel now, but at the time was, I think had fallen into significant disrepair. Um, about 300 people gathered in that basement. And what they were doing there was buying and selling and trading comics, but also other collectible items, uh, watching film screenings, and then also seeing guests like uh, science fiction author Ray Bradbury, who was a guest of honor there in the first year, as well as the comic artist, Jack Kirby. Um, and this is what you're seeing on the screen is a flyer from the first, uh, the first Comic-Con. So this is quite a bit different than what you see today. Today, Comic-Con's probably most widely known as a fan, con fan convention, but one that has really deep ties to Hollywood promotion. And that's because the industry often uses the event um, to publicize these really big kind of high profile transmedia franchises or blockbuster tent poles and also new and returning TV shows. And one of the things about Comic-Con that makes that possible of course is its proximity, its, its actual like geographical proximity to Hollywood. So it's a, it's a short trip. Um, and then timing wise in the summer when a lot of these big films are launching and when shows are returning in the fall is also makes it a really ideal time on the industry's promotional calendar. Um, so just to give you kind of an overview of what this convention looks like and what some of these spaces look like, um, the exhibit hall of the convention hosts over 460,000 square feet 
of retail sales, as well as these kind of trade show style promotional booths, meaning that you have this really huge space that has exhibitors that range from independent artists, um, small comics dealers or, or toy dealers to major manufacturers of collectibles and toys like um, Mattel and Hasbro and Funko to media conglomerates and their subsidiaries. So you can see on the screen there, there's a picture of the Warner Brothers booth, as well as there's a really, um, in the large picture, there is a photo of the um, Star Wars pavilion. So it's these big media companies, but also their licensees and their brands that are kind of all over the, the exhibit hall floor. And so there's a hierarchy that kind of happens in that space that's reflected in how you navigate it, which is to say that it's very crowded everywhere, but the congestion and concentration of those crowds get significantly more intense in some of those spaces that are where all those very familiar brands and name brands are kind of situated. Um, the programming at the event includes close to a thousand panels. They're devoted, a lot of panels are devoted to comics, but there's also a huge number of panels devoted to film television, toys, games, and all these other kind of niches of popular culture and fandom. Um, there's also a huge number of screenings, over 500 screenings. That includes um, a pretty extensive anime program, as well as an independent film festival that happens at the convention. And there's also an academic conference uh, that happens every year at Comic-Con called the Comic Arts Conference. The, the biggest and most high profile programming space at Comic-Con and one that I talk about a lot in the book and I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes um, is called Hall H. And you can see if you're if you can kind of see the the picture of the inside of the hall, it's kind of hard to capture what it really feels like and looks like to be inside there. But I would describe it as kind of like an airplane hangar like space. So what it is is actually a section of that big exhibit hall that's um, that's walled off and filled with about 6,500 seats. Um, and that's where, and, and a bunch of screens. And that's where you see those big Hollywood panels that where they bring like stars in and promote, you know, franchises like Star Wars, Marvel Cinematic Universe. And then also in recent years, increasingly a lot of high profile television shows. So we'll have panels held there. So, um, you know, like Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead. Um, a couple of years ago, they had like the Breaking Bad reunion. So kind of that's where a lot of that Hollywood promotion, Hollywood programming kind of happens. Um, Comic-Con is also really notorious for its really long lines. And Hall H has by far the longest line fan. And you can see some photos of it there. Um, fans frequently will camp out overnight both to get a seat in the room, but also to get a certain kind of seat in the room. So like to get closer to the front so you can be in closer proximity to some of those um, panels that are happening rather than having to sit in the back and just kind of see these tiny little figures at the front of the room um, and watch the action on the screen. So this is a site of, you know, there's lines everywhere. There's lines to get in, there's lines to go to each kind of panel and each different event, but the Hall H line is, is definitely one of the most notorious um, and longest lines at Comic-Con. And then another really interesting facet of the convention that's really kind of increased in the last sort of decade or so are these um, off-site activities. So there's a lot of events that happen outside the convention center and a large number of those are things that are, I would call like fan events that are maybe organized by fans that are meetups or parties, cosplay gatherings, et cetera. But then there's this whole other category of activity that are called marketing activations, which if you haven't heard that term before is basically an industry term for that, this kind of in-person marketing approach that is intended to get people to kind of ostensibly connect with a brand more deeply because they're having like an experience with it that's pleasurable so that there's like that emotional connection is formed. Um, this is not necessarily a new thing. I don't know if you remember all the, the, the Pepsi taste challenge or where sure. you were example. So like that's another example of kind of, of that kind of approach. Um, these marketing activations are very wide ranging at Comic-Con. So 
um, the photos I have here, you have, you know, maybe what you might expect. So there's a, a school bus there where they were doing a virtual reality experience to promote the film It. Um, and then the, uh, the other side of the screen on the bottom, there is um, an Amazon activation promoting, um, promoting their new uh, prime show, Jack Ryan, um, which as you can see is kind of like very problematically creating this generic kind of orientalist um, view and that like they had like a belly dancer in uh, off out of the frame there and so um, again it's trying to create this really like immersive immerse you into the world of the show um, which can be interesting in sites like that where it's like what world are you kind of creating and fictional where are you immersing people in um, but then you also have examples of these brands that are maybe looking to kind of attract Comic-Con fans or looking for, to connect with Comic-Con fans by like bringing in the, by coming into that space and like building something around ideas of fandom. So um, there's an the example of the Mac pop-up shop where they sold um, a cosmetics line celebrating the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. And then the most bizarre one I've ever encountered has was by far the, the Taco Bell activation, which was a tie-in with the anniversary of the film Demolition Man, which is kind of a 90s oddity, but the it's like it takes place in a dystopian future. And one of the conceits in this future is that there were these franchise wars with all the fast food restaurants and Taco Bell won. And so now every restaurant is a Taco Bell, even fine dining establishments. Um, so they set up a, a fine dining kind of Taco Bell. So like there's, these are pretty like in-depth and detailed um, efforts to kind of activate the brands in these various ways. Um, and then the other thing I want to say about what it's like to be at Comic-Con or what you might see at Comic-Con is to talk about obviously the crowds. So conservative estimates based on the capacity of the San Diego Convention Center suggest that the attendance at Comic-Con is around 130,000 people because that's, that's the cap. Um, but if you take into account the four day span of the event, which is actually five days if you include um, the preview night that Comic-Con holds uh, the night before the convention officially kicks off, and then all those activities I was talking about that are stationed around downtown San Diego that actually don't require a Comic-Con badge to participate so anyone can line up and do these activities. The number, the estimates start to rise to closer to 200,000 people drawn to downtown San Diego to the San Diego area during this, this time of year during Comic-Con. So as you can see, I mean, if you're getting a little anxious looking at these pictures in this, in this current moment we're in, um, you know, Comic-Con is, is the antithesis of social distancing um, that we're trying to do right now. So it probably is not, you know, surprising to hear that on April 17th, the organizers of Comic-Con announced that they had canceled the 51st annual Comic-Con, which makes 2020 the first year without a San Diego Comic-Con since the event was founded in 1970, which, I mean, speaks to kind of the importance of the event in terms of that historical, like that longevity and that sort of historical record. Like it's it's been not just going on, going strong for 50 years, but without interruption. And it it, it took this moment to kind of hit pause on that convention. So that fact, along with the coverage of the cancellation, um, which you see on the screen in so many different corners of the media. So it's not, it's fans, there's, you know, coverage in fan sites and on Twitter, but also industry trades and national news outlets. And that really speaks to Comic-Con's significant cultural footprint, which is one of the many reasons that I wanted to, to write this book. Um, so the book is largely structured around the spaces that I just talked about. The first chapter um, focuses on the convention as a whole by kind of looking at the prehistory and the early history of Comic-Con, going back to its roots in comic book fandom of the 1960s. And there's this frequent critique that happens, you know, that's been happening more recently, especially by folks that are really invested in comics or that have been attending Comic-Con for a really long time, some of them dating back 
to the 1970s that this increase of Hollywood promotion in the 21st century is kind of a sign that Comic-Con has somehow sold out or has moved really far away from its roots in comic book culture. And what I wanted to do with this kind of historical piece is to counter those narratives a bit, or at least just complicate them a bit um, by arguing that throughout its history, Comic-Con kind of always had this unique, had cultivated this unique space that really invited industry in by blurring the lines between fan labor and professional labor, but also from the very beginning, deliberately and very clearly cultivated an environment that promoted comics alongside film and television and other media. So that's to say that, that those things were always kind of part and parcel of the convention going back to its founding. And in, in fact, were kind of like built into kind of the DNA of what Comic-Con would be. The second chapter looks at what I would argue is one of the formative <laughs> experiences of attending Comic-Con, which is waiting in line. And what's especially fascinating to me about the lines and also the process of waiting in line at Comic-Con is that it kind of represents this liminal space, right? That's neither inside nor outside. You're, you're at Comic-Con and you're doing the Comic-Con thing, but you're not actually doing anything, right? You're just waiting. Um, and in this way, it kind of captures, that idea of liminality kind of captures the way in which I saw fandom being discursively situated at the event, which is to say that, um, the way that fans are talked about and invited to engage with the industry and industry promotion at Comic-Con kind of creates this odd dynamic where fans are kind of straddling this line between being producers of free publicity, but also like these idealized consumers that are, that are, that the industry is kind of engaging with and trying to invite to consume more. Um, but also that there's this weird liminal space that's happening for fans as Comic-Con becomes kind of part fan show and part trade show between being an industry insider and outsider, right? So that all that stuff is really captured by this weird experience of, of waiting in line um, and the way in which waiting in line and the vis like the visibility of fans waiting in line automatically inflates that exclusivity and value of the industry's promotions that are happening inside the convention center. Um, the third chapter moves from the place of fans in line to the place of Hollywood in the convention center. So this chapter is kind of working to complicate and critique this idea of Hall H hysteria, which is a phrase that I saw used a few times in the trades, but captures like a much larger discursive thrust around Comic-Con about like celebrating the enthusiasm and of fans and their power to really like make a film successful, but then also this continual anxiety about the unruliness or unpredictability of fans at Comic-Con and like, uh, you know, if, like what if they don't like it? What if they spread negative buzz? Um, what if they pirate and our footage and release it online? So this chapter kind of gives this detailed account of one day in Hall H, um, attending like a whole day of panels there in order to talk about how the exclusivity of Hollywood promotion at Comic-Con is really carefully constructed and then also in need of really constant maintenance and like intense control um, measures that are implemented there. So in doing and creating this account, I also integrate evidence from media coverage of the panels in order to argue that the promotions in Hall H are really all about emphasizing this idea of like an organic and unpredictable um, experience of being there. Like you had to be there to really have that experience. But at the same time, the ex exclusivity that being there creates is really in intended to propel those promotional messages, that hype and buzz and publicity outside and beyond the walls of the convention center to the general public. Um, chapter four of the book returns to thinking again about the history of the San Diego Comic-Con and its connections to comic culture in order to look at specifically the evolution of Comic-Con's retail space, um, which 
began as what was called the dealer's room and then eventually evolved and morphed into this big exhibit hall that we have today. So this chapter, with this chapter, I really wanted to like think about decentering production and promotion as the core sites of meaning in order to think about the role of retail and consumption, because that's a really big part of Comic-Con and what, what is being sold to fans at Comic-Con as well. Um, so in the same way that, that Comic-Con's early history blurred those lines between fan and industry labor, the space of the exhibit hall kind of reconfigures consumerism and these retail transactions as really exclusive experiences. And that's also consistent throughout its history, but just in different ways. So in the 70s and 80s, that was really rooted in the practice of comic book dealers and comic collectors that were happening in that space and the comic industry as well. Um, and then with this influx of film and television exhibitors and, and their licensees that happens in the 1990s and 2000s, the ex that exclusivity gets in intertwined with the trade show style promotion I was talking about and kind of gets, consumption gets re reconfigured as this pathway to insider access as well. And then finally, the conclusion of the book looks at those marketing activations I was talking about, um, both at Comic-Con and beyond, because this isn't, that's not just a practice that is happening at Comic-Con. Marketing activations are common at a lot of big events and festivals like Coachella and South by Southwest, but also regularly get organized um, just on their own as kind of promotional activities. So like when Netflix launched the Gilmore Girls reboot, they did a pop-up shop for one single day around North America and in big cities where you could go and like go to Luke's coffee shop from the show. Um, so by looking at these marketing activations more broadly, I wanted to sort of end the book by thinking about the ways in which industry, industries, not just Hollywood, but brands in the process of promoting themselves are treating all audiences like Comic-Con fans or like fans by deploying these promotional strategies that make consumption and, the, and consuming commodities feel kind of in, like an exclusive experience. So attending Comic-Con regularly so that I can examine and understand how these spaces function, especially in relation to industry promotion, has been a really important part of my approach since I started this research in 2009. But equally important has been extensive archival research. So looking through 50 plus years of ephemera from the event, like programs and progress reports, as well as really extensive analysis of media discourses that have circulated about Comic-Con over the years. And my approach in combining that kind of in-person field research with archival research and discourse analysis was to use these methods to think about the tensions in the ways in which the histories and spaces of San Diego Comic-Con were kind of experienced and how they're talked about outside the event. Um, and what idea, what meanings kind of circulate in those discourses. And what I found was that discourses about Comic-Con and Hollywood and fans often hinged on this idea of exclusivity. Um, but then at the same time, you know, there were so many ways in which um, that exclusivity was, was happening um, under the purview of, of Hollywood's desires and needs and what's they, what they wanted kind of from that audience or how they wanted to shape ideas and def definitions of what it means to be a fan. Um, so I feel like this wouldn't be a proper book talk if I didn't read at least some small part of my book. So maybe I will, do. I will, I will exit the screen share mode here. And um, I just want to read a brief passage where I'm talking about this idea of exclusivity and the limits of exclusivity. Um, so the discourses about Hollywood fans and Comic-Con often hinge on exclusivity. They identify Comic-Con as an exclusive media event in order to suggest that fans are an exclusive demographic of tastemakers. And the evidence they present that celebrities and film studios are flocking to Comic-Con highlights the exclusivity of Hollywood as a powerful media institution. Not only that, but the event itself is steeped in the idea of exclusive experiences. Collectors can purchase exclusive merchandise. Companies give away exclusive swag. Studios screen exclusive footage and throw exclusive parties. And attendees who manage to literally win the lottery, the tickets are sold by like a lottery system, 
um, and buy Comic-Con tickets or wait in line for hours or days have exclusive access to it all. In these cases, exclusivity points to the presence of something specific, an event, an item, an audience, an industry, but it's important to remember that exclusivity is not actually defined by presences at all, but by the power to produce absences. The word exclusive, after all, is semantically worded in, rooted in exclusion. This means that for something to be considered exclusive, access must also be limited in some way. As Pierre Bourdieu suggests, limits work to organize our understanding of our social world, but in internalizing these limits, we also tend to forget they exist. For this reason, it is important to think about the limits of exclusivity, the power of limits, the power to set limits, and how these limits ultimately mask and naturalize the power imbalances that allow them to function in the first place. Exclusivity is also, also a significant driver of value, meaning that controlling and limiting access are frequently deployed as promotional strategies. Thus, the limits of exclusivity, which manifest around the event space, attendees, and the industry, work to situate Comic-Con as a site of media industry promotion. But even more important, or only at Comic-Con argues, are the ways in which Hollywood is able to shape, adjust, expand, and overcome these limits, ultimately maintaining its power as a hegemonic media institution, even in a space that seems to celebrate the cultural impact of fandom. And I think I will I will stop it there for now. Thank you so much for giving me the time to talk about well, the book a little more. And I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. I'll, I definitely will have some. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's a fascinating, fascinating project. Um, the first question I guess I have is, um, how did you get started on this? What what uh, what compelled you to take on this material, this topic? I wish I could say that I had this brilliant idea from the beginning to be like, I'm gonna I'm gonna write a book on the San Diego Comic Con. This goes back to my um, to grad school and st starting sort of research for my dissertation. And my original intention was to was in this in a similar arena was to look at like media industry promotion and fans. And I I got a travel uh, grant from the University of Michigan to go for summer research to Comic-Con, which is where I was gonna, oh, like, let's look at sort of what's happening. It wasn't until I got to Comic-Con that I realized that what was what was happening in that space itself was a, its own, not, it was its own thing, but it also connected to all those other ideas I wanted to talk about, which was to say that like, we're, we were, we were and kind of continue, I think maybe even more so to be in this moment where the discourses about fans have shifted to a talking about fans as being really powerful and influential and and sort of this demographic of tastemakers and b that everyone is a fan now like that 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 term gets kind of thrown around and used both by both in popular discourses but also in industry discourses like they call their audience fans like if you've watched the movie you're a fan of of you know <laughs> captain america now um so when I got to Comic-Con, I, I saw this space where um, I remember this very clearly, this moment of standing, being like up at the top of these steps in the convention center, which since they've closed down and told you you're not allowed to stand on, <laughs> they're controlling the crowds evermore. But um, looking out at the streets, at all this, this huge flood of, of bodies coming into and out of the convention center and thinking, what... I, instead of thinking like how, you know, like th thinking how controlled everything was, you know, that there's this real tension that's happening between this, this, this huge group of people, but like f for the event to function smoothly, they have to be like really orderly and controlled to a certain degree or it all falls apart, which is, I mean, that's the social order. But I mean, it just sort of started me thinking about, um, thinking about the ways that, that, there's this weird disconnect in terms of like how these, the, how fans are being talked about as really powerful, but all the ways in which the industry is also trying to control and anticipate and predict and, and, and tamp down any possible kind of unruliness and, and benefit. Like it's beneficial to be like fans are powerful, fans are tastemakers and then be like, fans are seeing our movies. So go see, you know, so like there's this in interesting tension that emerged that when I saw the space and was in the space, um, 
that those issues of like control really kind of jumped out at me even more. Were you a comic fan? Um, yeah, I, I definitely like have those kind of nerdy proclivities throughout my life. And I spent a, a good chunk of time in my 20s hanging out at the comic shop on Wednesday nights, which is when the new issues come out. So I haven't necessarily like, I wouldn't call myself um, a fan, I think, in the sense that of like, really, really deeply immersed in these texts. Um, there's certainly, I'm certainly like my knowledge is more about Comic-Con itself. Like I'm a fan of, mm -hmm. I'm like, a, I, where I, what I'm a really nerd for, big nerd for is like the history of Comic-Con and like all the, what all those comic fans were up to in like the sixties and seventies, that stuff really fascinates me. So I think I've learned the most about comics culture from that part of the research. Um, but yeah, like definitely the, my interest in this topic came from a personal interest and, in, and in like my taste in, in the kinds of media I was consuming before I started to study these things, but I've never been like an active participant in, I mean, being a fan is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a lot of work to like, cause there, you know, there's, you're producing, I mean, the, I mean, a fan in the sense, not as the broad kind of mainstream definition, but you know, to, to, to write fan fiction or to like really intensely dissect texts and, um, to be, to foster that kind of community. So I feel, I, I, I can't claim that, but I definitely had my taste kind of tilts in those directions for sure. Um, I know part of your uh, method is uh, field work and, uh, you know, speaking with the people that, that are the fans. Do you, do you have any particular striking people that you encountered there that are, you know, that were exemplary for you or particularly revealing about the phenomenon that you were interested in studying? I think, I mean, so my approach to the field, I, I would I would describe my field research, I mean, you can call it participant observation, I call it lurking almost, <laughs> um, <laughs> in a sense um, that a lot of it was, was, was really like just listening and observing. Um, but I did have some, you may, I mean, you do, like you're waiting in line for you know, five hours, you have conversations with people. Um, and I think one of the early encounters I had that was, that was really, again, like, I think shaped the future direction of the project was um, in 2009, I was at a panel for um, Avatar, the film, James Cameron film. Um, and I happened to be seated next to someone that um, worked on the film. And so he was really like, uh, and he was talking, he talked to me about like, I think he did like probably worked at in VFX and he talked to me a little bit about, you know, the really long hours he put in. I mean, VFX work is, is just, I mean, it's not unionized. It's extremely intense. Um, it's a precarious job. Um, so he was like, he was talking to me about like, this film and how long he worked on it. But then, you know, it kind of struck me that he was also attending the panel as a fan. And in fact, you know, he didn't have, a, he didn't have reserved seats or, you know, any type of special access. Um, and like, I think that moment really struck me in the sense of the ways that, the, that, the way that inviting that kind of affective labor cr crosses between sort of industry labor and fan labor in terms of being like, you're doing it for the love of what you're doing. And so by inviting people inside the industry and outside the industry to identify as fans or to see that as like a pathway to being, to having some sort of insider status or relationship with the industry, it really cultivates that kind of, um, that kind of free labor and affective labor that, that invites people kind of in our neoliberal <laughs> age to kind of do more Mm -hmm. um, and be compensated less. And so it was like, it was just a really interesting exchange, um, to, to hear. Cause I was like, why aren't you, shouldn't you have one of these nice, like these awesome reserve seats? But of course those are for, um, you know, some studio people, but mostly for journalists that are, that are invited to these panels it's from pub like specific publications to cover them. Mm -hmm. Um, so those kinds of moments were some of those power imbalances kind of, become evident are were always really interesting to me. 
So one of the things I find especially interesting about the book is the kind of historical work you do tracing the history of, of uh, Comic-Con from the uh, 1970 to the present. And I, sh I will tell you that um, when I was a teenager, I went to the first Star Trek convention in New York City. Um, <laughs> I know. I told you I'm a nerd for the convention. Yeah. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, and, you know, the the ethos at that event, it, it, I mean, it was a completely different kind of exclusivity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the people that were there were, I mean, this was before cons even were anything for, for popular culture. This right. is one of the first. And the I'm wondering about this shift that's happened when you've moved from a convention that's relatively small and that the attendees are the people that create the comics and the consumers of comics mm -hmm. versus what you have now is 200,000 people, a huge amount of Hollywood. And there's much more than comics at Comic-Con, much, much more than comics. I mean, not, not only the films that spin off from comics, but Breaking Bad, you mentioned, for example, yeah. Gilmore Girls, that, you know, those are not comic things. I'm wondering about, you know, are you mentioned this you that you were interested in kind of deconstructing this dichotomy between the true comic fans and the hordes of hollywood people that are there now um is there like a moment in this 50 year period where this thing starts to change is there one film that i mean i the first iron man is that the thing that turned the tide what did you find about that well it's interesting because see, this is what's really fascinating about it is that first of all, you can kind of step back and look at if you, I mean, look at the history of Comic-Con and Comic-Con in the seventies, for example, that, and other conventions too, in fact, that they're really like happening on a, like you said, on kind of a subcultural level. These are at kind of at the margins of popular culture. Um, but in ter so are, so is, you know, so like there's still, but there's still like this space that's happening where there's an industry that's trying to sell to this group, even in like the seventies. So at Comic-Con that looked a lot more like Marvel and DC starting to show up at the convention and do that same kind of, I mean, it's happening at a smaller scale, but it's that same kind of promotional outreach to fans. I'm going to show you actually a figure in the book. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but uh -huh. it's, this is an ad from, one of the early, I think it was 76 programs. So like there's that kind of industry presence is really there from the beginning. And that's kind of how comics culture was in a sense, like that line between fan and professional was, it was, it was blurry and like there was a lot of interaction there, partly because as an industry comic book professionals, like writers and artists were so treated so poorly in terms of like their own, like owning their, their own copyright to their work, et cetera. So, it's a little, it's a different dynamic than what you see today. And that there was also, you know, Star Wars, the first Star Wars film was promoted at Comic-Con in 76. It was happening. It was a, a real grassroots attempt to kind of drum up interest in a film that was untested and didn't, they didn't really know what was going to happen with it, but it's there. Um, I think the tipping point was happened around the turn of the 21st century. A lot of stuff in the popular press, a lot of Comic-Con attendees, there's a real frequent um, tendency to cite the film Twilight mm. specifically. But I just like hugely disagree with that. So like the argument is that all these new fans, AKA women, right? <laughs> like mm. women and, and young women um, started flooding to Comic-Con because of the Twilight films were being promoted there. and. Every, and so a lot of the tenor of those discourses about Twilight being that ship, that tipping point mm -hmm. tend to be like, even if they're not explicitly saying them, saying it, they're kind of saying like the, we lost, like our, like our tree, like you invaded the, the tree house, you know, like there it's, there's a sense of kind of like this, that these folks are interlopers. Um, but what I think actually, I think what actually happened is that shift goes back earlier to the opening of Hall H, which was in 2004. And that's when you start to see, I mean, they opened it to be, to serve that purpose, to start hosting these Hollywood panels. So it's like a slow progression, but you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy was promoted at Comic-Con. Um, 
And then I think it it also kind of coincides with um, the rise of the internet in the late '90s. You start to get this another uh, one of the the big moments of like this these discourses about like it's cool to be a nerd and like fans are influential are rooted in um, the rise of movie bloggers in the late nineties. So like, you know, Harry Knowles and ain't it cool news is an example, which is a site that has, I mean, in addition to Harry Knowles having had some, some um, sexual harassment allegations and having stepped back from that in during the me too period, um, it also lost a lot of its cultural cachet kind of like as, as, as a fan site or even as a source of industry news because that's so much of that stuff has been corporatized since then but in the late 90s there was this moment where they were like Harry Knowles can tank your movie um, if he doesn't like it and so it's kind of like I don't think it's one single thing but I think there is kind of this 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 moment that happens around the turn of the 21st century where um, you know the rise of the internet um, Hollywood's kind of um, desire to to be kind of conservative in terms of their, they start like shifting um, away from like doing less in-house production. And so they want to be really conservative about and make sure they get like the most bang for their, the buck on their films. And so doing like franchises and, and reboots and adaptations becomes like a way to kind of control, get some of that control back and be like, this is a little more predictable. So I think it's a lot of those things that coalesce roughly in like the late late 90s early to mid 2000s rather than being like you know a bunch twilight was really popular at comic con because of course i mean you know that would that's neither the first nor the last film to to draw a tremendous amount of attention and bodies into that space mm -hmm. um so yeah so th this will be my last question and it goes back to this point about um the sort of tension between the agency of the fans and the control of the industry or the industries. And the point you raise about gender, I think, is an interesting one in this regard. I'm thinking of the, you know, the anxiety that um, the fans will see something at Comic-Con and rise up against it. And in terms of the gender, I'm thinking of the, the uh, reboot of Ghostbusters with an all-female cast, which really became a kind of uh, flashpoint for that kind of um, hostile, gendered hostile fan response and impacted the industry. Can you say a little bit more about the kind of um, the, the strategies that the industry is using as they're coming to understand this phenomenon of, you know, the fans trying to destroy a film or take it down and 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 that often there's a kind of gender dimension to that yeah i mean i think it's interesting because that it was around i think 2010 that there was there was a few articles published where like our studios pulling it pulling away from comic-con because they like promoted a bunch of duds there basically <laughs> like the previous year like the bunch of movies kind of got enthusiastic responses at comic-con and then and then kind of underperformed. So that was like the one, the first moment of that, even before like the, those kind of toxic fandom discourses started to happen. Um, but I think like that really relates to this idea of exclusivity too. And and you know, fan study scholars um, as well as folks studying the industry have have talked about this a little bit. That like um, that like there is this boundary, that, this boundary policing that's happening, right? That it's like things are getting more inclusive and then those limits start immediately trying to we're trying to like find those limits again right and to try and try and um to try and kind of push back on that coming from a, a subsection or a, a smaller group of of consumers or fans um that's happening and like you you definitely see that at comic-con um and i've noticed a I think I've noticed kind of a gradual shift in the past couple of years that I've been in terms of just maybe studios being a little more willing to overtly discuss like di diversity and like talk and like celebrate that. But I remember, I think it was 2013, I write about this in the book um, as well, that there was a panel held in Hall H 
um, that was a panel of women of act actresses talking about it's called women who kick ass and they have it every year um talking about their experiences and they had such a frank discussion and this was before me too like this is kind of before that that moment where it's we're starting to talk about it more and more in sort of popular discourses but um such a frank discussion about like sexism in the industry about the challenges particularly facing actresses of color and it was like this really really interesting and invigorating discussion that kind of was plopped in the middle of the day where the morning you had uh, Warner Brothers unveiling, gosh, I don't know, the Batman versus Superman movie and then Marvel um, unveiling its next slate of, of films. Um, and, you know, the reception to it was lukewarm in the crowd and a person, a man like four rows up from me at the end of the panel yelled at the top of his lung when it lungs when it ended women who talk too much and it was just like such a disheartening moment but it was and just really jarring but then i realized well like during this whole time like people have been getting up and going to the bathroom going to concession stand um and then even though he was just one person that like yelled it out across the hall that got that made it into the some of the coverage of that panel, like people, it was commented upon, like an article in Grantland described it happening. And so it really exemplified for me the way that like one voice can be amplified so much, in that, even like, even though, I mean, I think a lot of other people were thinking it frankly, um, and that's what their behavior suggested, but to hear that one voice amplified. And I think the sad thing is, is that um, with the Ghostbusters film, and I think in other instances too, you get, a, there's a lot of places where I think the industry is maybe not obviously, but kind of subtly trying to appease, rather than being like, no, we're not doing this. This is like, this is nonsense. They're trying to like appease both sides, you know, to be like, well, let's not alienate these people too much and still invite in these other people um, into this space. And I think like that moment at Comic-Con was a, a moment where that tension it manifests in like a physical space in in a in terms of like how that panel was located in the day and how it was people responded to it um, in a way that you can't see or observe in quite the same way when you're seeing that vitriol spewed on like Twitter, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it definitely like it affects the way that Comic Con is experienced by a lot of people too. I think. Um, when you're in, I mean, because folks that want to, you know, there's a lot of, there's plenty of panels um, that are, you know, talking about like fan communities of color or like women in comics and things like that, right? But that's a self-selected group. As soon as you get into that Hall H space, that's like this big space that's supposed to be for what everyone wants to see, like you start to, you hear those those voices again, right? That's like, in a space that's ostensibly supposed to be like more inclusive. And I think that's what's happening <laughs> right now too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Erin, I want to thank you so much for uh, talking to us about your new book, uh, Only at Comic-Con, Hollywood Fans and the Limits of Exclusivity. It's been a really fascinating conversation and thanks so much for um, helping us go online with our talks. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. It's been really great. Um, again, I'm going to sign off as Paul Pepys for the Oregon Humanities Center. If you want to learn more about upcoming events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center, you can go to our website at ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks a lot. See you next time.